Good morning and welcome. My name is Kathy Nalabaiko and I am the president of the Ukrainian Institute of America. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our distinguished panelists and everyone in our audience to today's webinar, COVID-19 Perspectives from the Frontline, US and Ukraine, which will be conducted in English. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Ukrainian Institute of America or the UIA, as we are often called for short, please allow me a moment of introduction. The UIA is a nonprofit membership-based organization located in New York City that is dedicated to promoting the art, music, and literature of Ukraine and the Ukrainian diaspora. Founded in 1948, we serve both as a center for the Ukrainian American community and as America's window on Ukraine, hosting a wide variety of programs, including art exhibits, concerts, film screenings, poetry readings, literary events, children's programs, lectures, symposia, educational programs, and webinars like this one, all open to the general public. Today's topic, COVID-19 and the impact it has had both here in the US and in Ukraine is a critical one since this pandemic has affected every aspect of life, work, and community globally. Here at the Ukrainian Institute, for example, we had to shift the way in which we provide our programming from mainly in-person events to, exclu to exclusively virtual experiences, such as this one, since our building, along with so many others, has had to remain closed. Thanks to our very talented and dedicated staff members, we were able to quickly pivot our offerings to an online format. Now, every day, we post something new and interesting, either an article, an interview, a virtual art tour, a clip from one of our former concerts, just to name a few examples, on all of our social media channels, which include Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. We also have hosted several live online events, such as this webinar, as well as a solo piano concert. Every Friday, we send an email to the more than 5,000 people globally who are on our mailing list, recapping our activities for the week. So if you're not already on that list, but would like to be, or if you're interested in becoming a member of the Ukrainian <coughs> Institute, please send an email to director at ukraineinstitute.org with your specific request. As a not-for-profit organization, we are largely funded and supported by private donations. We kindly ask that you, if you enjoy today's program, you consider making a charitable contribution of any size as a gesture of your appreciation. During the course of the webinar, we will be intermittently posting a link in the chat room through which you may make this donation. Of course, you may always visit our website at www.ukraineinstitute.org to make a donation or to keep abreast of our activities. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn the floor over to Anya Shu, a member of our board of directors and the powerhouse on our programs committee, who is largely responsible for organizing today's webinar. She'll go over some housekeeping issues and introduce our amazing panelists. Anya. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for an introduction and thank Thanks everyone for joining from all over the world. Um, I hope everyone is safe and sound. As Kathy mentioned, my name is Anya Spook and I'm delighted to introduce our today um, topic of today. But before I do that, a couple of housekeeping matters. If you lose the connection, please bear with us. You'll be reconnected automatically or you can refresh your tab and it'll do the trick. Uh, the webinar will run for hour and, uh, hour, one hour and 15 minutes and will be recorded so you can share it with your friends and family after the event. As Kathy mentioned, um, in addition to the chat tab uh, on your Zoom, there will be also a Q&A tab live during the event. So please watch for that tab to go live to post your questions. Now on the topic for today's event, COVID-19 has affected lives of all of us. Here in US, we've seen some spikes. Um, we've seen some worse statistics uh, <coughs> in terms of hospitalization and mortality rates. And now we've seen this in Ukraine. We have many friends and families here and in Ukraine uh, and we're living our new normal. So in the Ukrainian Institute of America, I'm extremely honored to have this amazing panel of medical experts to provide their perspectives um, on the current situation. Our moderator for today's event, uh, Dr. Igor Mahun, 
is board certified in internal medicine by the American Board of Internal Medicine. He's a fellow of the American College of Physicians as his husband in private practice since 1990. He has served on numerous hospital committees. Dr. Mahoon received both his bachelor and, med and master degrees in cellular microsurgery from New York University. He completed his medical education at the Autonomous University of Guadalajara and completed his res residency in internal medicine in New York City at Bell Hospital and, Bo uh, and Booth Memorial Medical Center. Dr. Magoon has been a regular contributor to the medical column in our Life magazine for 30 years. He's also a member, supporter, and patron of the Ukrainian Institute of America. Dr. Ulyano Suprun is currently heading up the nonprofit, non governmental organization RQA, a newly formed Ukrainian think tank providing analysis research and creating solutions in spheres of healthcare, media, and government relations, national security, and culture. Dr. Suprun served as the acting minister of health of Ukraine from 2016 through 2019. She is the founder and former director of the NGO Patriot Defense founder of the School of for Rehabilitation Medicine at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Viv, and former director of humanitarian initiatives for the Ukrainian World Congress. During her time as minister, Dr. Sopoon and her team passed a sweeping healthcare transformation into law. This transformational repealed the failed Soviet system and replaced it with a modern system based on international best practices. The new system focuses on primary care, provides state insurance for every Ukrainian citizen, establishes a guaranteed package of healthcare services, increasing healthcare workers' salaries to market levels, cuts corruption and bribes in the medical system, and offers a reimbursement for medical medicines program for patients suffering from chronic diseases. As an indication of its success over the course of one year, more than 28 million Ukrainians sign up for the new healthcare system. Rear Admiral Dr. Boris Lushnyak has been Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland since January 2017 after serving as <coughs> Department Chair of Preventive Medicine and Professor of Dermatology at the Un Uniform Services University. He was the U.S. Deputy Surgeon General from 2010 to, through 2015, Acting Surgeon General from 2013 through 14, and was responsible for the 50th Anniversary Surgeon General's a report on smoking and health, and the Surgeon's General Call to Action to Prevent Skin Cancer. During the Ebola response in 2015, he commanded U.S. Public Health Service Monrovia Medical Unit in Liberia. He attended Northwestern University and then Harvard Uni University with Masters in Public Health and completed residen residencies in family medicine and dermatology and is certified uh, in dermatology and preventive medicine. He began his U.S. public health service career in 1988 in Epidemic Intelligence Service and served with National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health until 2004, and he was a part of the team at Ground Zero and CDC Anthrax team. In 2004, he transitioned to the FDA in the Office of Counterterrorism and was appointed FDA Assistant Commissioner in 2005. He retired from the U.S. Public Health Service in 2015 as the two-star rear admiral after 20 years in the uni uniform services. I would like to thank our three experts for finding time today to speak with us. And without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to turn this event over to Dr. Magun to lead, to lead the panel. Dr. Magun. Hi, thank you, Anya. Very nice to uh, uh, be here and thank you for joining us. <clears throat> These are challenging times. The United States, Ukraine, and the entire world share many adversities and fears. The medical community follows and responds to local realities and the population statistics as they accumulate and are analyzed. We need to plan for the worst with the limitations of epidemiological models. We, the medical community, grasp the concept that flattening the curve does not mean the virus is gone. The clinical implication of COVID-19 infection in individuals critically ill is the true reality of the pandemic. The spectrum of clinical illness is enormous. Many people are infected yet remain well, while others progress quickly to a critical state requiring intensive care. Medical facilities are stressed to the maximum. All 
workers are working unlimited shifts, have direct exposure to the virus, and face daily draining experiences with limited personal protective equipment. However, the medical community has responded tremendously and is inspirational. Many have volunteered and clearly putting themselves in harm's way. Today, we have the unique opportunity to have their perspective done, uh, presented from the aspect of Ukraine and from the United States. I'd like to first uh, introduce Dr. Ulana Suprun, who will be followed by uh, Dr. Boris Lusniak's presentation of the United States version. Dr. Ulana. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for um, inviting me and for um, having such a, a great event, because I think it's important for those Ukrainians who live in the United States to know and understand what's happening here in Ukraine and to also share our experience here with um, uh, Dr. Lushnyak and others in the United States. Perhaps we can learn from each other and that's always the best thing that we can do. Um, to start off, I'll just give you some statistics on what's going on as of July 11th or as of today. There have been 52,843 cases of infection with SARS-CoV-2. Now, let's, um, let's distinguish the two of them. There's those that have a positive test and are infected, and then there are those that actually have symptoms and have the disease COVID-19. So right now, we're just talking about those that have had positive tests so that they've had infections. There's been 1,372 deaths reported from COVID-19. 25,810 people have recovered. Currently, there are about 4,050 people hospitalized. 91 of those are connected or are on a ventilator. A total of 13,443 people needed hospitalization uh, since the first case was, in, uh, was reported on March 3rd. 418 people since March 3rd uh, had to be on ventilators. Uh, COVID was uh, confirmed uh, in, um, or the um, uh, positive tests were confirmed in 3,634 children. Um, unfortunately, over 7,000 medical staff. Um, there were about 750,000 uh, PCR tests performed in Ukraine. However, for each single patient that's positive, there are at least three tests performed. So that correlates with about 175,000 people having been tested. Um, and let's go through the timeline of what happened. Um, in January, uh, we all um, heard uh, the end of December, beginning of January, that there was a new uh, pneumonia that uh, started um, in China, in Wuhan, China. We uh, here in Ukraine heard about it in January uh, when um, the World Health Organization began its investigation. So January, the full month, pretty much, February, and our first case was in March, but our cases really started going up at the end of March. In Ukraine, we had about two and a half months to prepare uh, for what would be happening with the pandemic in Ukraine. On January 31st, the National Security and Defense Council, or the RNBO secretary, wrote an appeal to the prime minister, at that time it was Honcharuk, and asked to ban the export of medical equipment, masks and uh, PPE, so that um, they would stay in Ukraine. However, that ban was not put in place until the end of February, which um, uh, when looking back at records, literally millions of masks and PPE were exported out of Ukraine to places like Romania and actually to China and Hong Kong. Uh, that led to the fact that uh, when the first cases started in Ukraine, there was a very low supply of PPE and the medical community did not have the protection that it needed. On February 20th, uh, the plane from Wuhan arrived in Ukraine, which was uh, bringing, uh, evacuating those Ukrainians that had been left in place in Wuhan over a, uh, almost an entire month period of time. I don't know if you remember, but it was not a very good, um, uh, it wasn't a very smooth event. There were protests in five Ukrainian cities because the uh, people in the cities were, um, were brought to understand that if those uh, people were evacuated into their city, that there would be a very high risk that they would become infected. Um, later, the um, uh, inst in Institute uh, of the Study of War has shown that this actually was a, a Russian propaganda um, special operation to create distrust in the government of Ukraine. And if you're interested, I can leave the, um, the uh, 
link to the article that talks about how this actually was a Russian special operation to undermine the trust in government in Ukraine. Um, uh, at the time uh, when that evacuation happened, because of this, uh, this event that wasn't very well organized and there was a lot of um, distrust of government, uh, the Minister of Health at that time, Zoryana Skaletska, actually stayed in place with the people that were evacuated uh, under observation for 14 days. And um, at that time, also around uh, that time, the first PCR tests were given to Ukraine from the WHO. So until that point, there had been no testing done at all in Ukraine, and there had been no um, uh, capability to tell whether or not any cases were in place. There have been reports that people have presented, had presented with the symptoms of COVID to their family physicians and to hospitals. However, we can, can't confirm that because there were no tests in place. Um, while uh, in isolation, uh, the uh, government changed in Ukraine in the end of February and uh, Zoryana Skaletska was let go and a new uh, minister was put in place for a period of three weeks. And then he was let go and then another new minister was put in place. So over the span of a uh, one month period of time, there were three different ministers of health, which did not help to organize and coordinate the response. Um, on March 17th, uh, the Verkhovna Rada voted a, uh, prevent, a COVID-19 prevention law um, in which uh, money was put aside to start uh, procuring PPE, procuring tests to um, uh, designate which hospitals were going to be the ones that were treating COVID patients. And uh, there had been quite a bit of delay in having all of this organized. Um, at that time, uh, what ended up happening is the president himself uh, started asking for help from other countries because the Ministry of Health, because of those numerous changes and uh, incapacity to be able to move forward, wasn't doing a very good job of procuring tests or equipment. So um, as uh, many of you probably remember in the middle, uh, in the beginning of the war, the Russian-Ukrainian war, when uh, Crimea was occupied by Russia and then Eastern Ukraine was attacked by Russian forces, the people of Ukraine uh, became very active and um, businesses and NGOs and regular folks were bringing, buying and bringing PPE, buying and bringing any kind of uh, equipment that was necessary, uh, trying to find uh, the um, ventilators to be able to donate to hospitals. However, as you know, when you have a ventilator, it's not simply the machine, you also have to have oxygen and you have to have electricity and you have to have um, the uh, anesthesiologist and the anesthesia to be able to put patients on the ventilators. So all of this was being organized mostly by uh, civil society and businesses. It took quite a long time for the government to get their act together and to start um, responding in any coordinated manner. Um, because of the, uh, in the beginning, there was uh, the first two months, um, all we heard in, in the media was reports from the a minister from the president and from uh, other um, speakers, uh, official speakers of government, uh, we heard that Ukraine is ready, we have everything, the hospitals have all the beds they need, um, the ventilators are in place and so on. And when the first patients started being hospitalized and when the first cases started coming into the hospitals in a larger number, which was really in the beginning of April, we found that none of that was true. And um, there was a scramble to try to get things organized. Um, this story is probably quite similar to much of what happened in many of your countries. So Ukraine is not necessarily different than others, but what we have is the additional challenges of um, a war happening on our territory, as well as a concerted effort by uh, Russian disinformation to undermine uh, communication with the population. So since there was a lack of honest communication and a lack of coordinated communication in the beginning, which is not uncommon as it was in many other countries, in Ukraine, this was, um, this was um, uh, escalated by the uh, concerted effort by Russian disinformation to undermine trust in what the government was doing. Uh, quarantine or what was called lockdown in a lot of, a lot of other countries um, was instituted in uh, the middle of March. Um, for two months, the metros were shut down. There was no public transportation. There was no transportation of trains or airplanes, anything between oblasts. Um, businesses were closed. Uh, 
people were told to stay home and only uh, physicians, uh, infrastructure workers uh, were able to go to work and uh, use public transportation in a very limited matter. Um, pretty much the entire country was closed down and uh, quarantine began to ease uh, on about June 10th. Um, during that period of time, um, between March 15th and, and June 10th, not a great deal was done to prepare society and to prepare businesses, prepare the uh, public uh, institutions to uh, easing up of lockdown. And so since um, June 10th, there's actually been an uptick in cases. So we used to have between say 200 and 300 cases a day during the lockdown. Now we have anywhere between 800 to 1000 cases a day. Although as in very many countries, we've not increased the mortality rate. We haven't seen the, the number of increase in the number of deaths. So more positive tests, however, not more people being um, put in hospital or having severe symptoms. Um, there's a, a big issue with testing in Ukraine. As I said, um, for a population of estimated 37 million on Ukrainian controlled territories, um, only about between 150 and 175,000 people have been tested because there's a lack of the actual tests um, because they are expensive and Ukraine has not been able to buy them. Um, Ukraine does not manufacture its own tests and many countries don't want to sell the tests. Um, they haven't been procured in the proper manner. There's been um, quite a bit of issues with the way proc procurement is being done at a national level. Um, Ukraine hasn't been able to do the extensive testing that has been done in other countries. Um, of uh, uh, the only people getting tested are those that actually have symptoms and are hospitalized, not just have symptoms, but have symptoms and are hospitalized and their immediate contacts and not always are their immediate contacts tested with PCR tests. Some of them are being given ELISA test or the, the quick test to see whether they have um, uh, the, they have the um, uh, immunity to, uh, to uh, SARS-CoV-2 rather than actually having the virus. Um, it's, an, it's an unfortunate uh, development because if you can't test enough people, then it's harder to keep control over where the outbreaks are happening. Um, many people ask, why does Ukraine not have such a high rate of, uh, of infection, a high rate of uh, mortality or deaths? Um, probably the answer to the first question is uh, somewhat in the field of a lack of testing combined with uh, the uh, lockdown, very severe lockdown that had been put in place and combined with the fact that um, uh, we don't believe that all the numbers are being told to us honestly. Um, on top of that, um, when we look at the population of Ukraine, it's relatively sparsely dispersed in many places. The largest uh, accumulation of positive tests are in Kyiv and Lviv, in those cities that have the highest populations. And the rest of Ukraine is relatively sparsely populated, so it's a different type of population structure. The second thing is um, when you look at the mortality uh, or the average age of those who died from COVID-19 in countries like the UK or in, um, in Italy, it's between the ages of 78 and 82. Ukraine's um, average uh, age of uh, death is 72. So many Ukrainians aren't even, don't even live to the age where most of the mortality is happening. And Ukraine doesn't have the um, societal tradition of having elderly or those that um, need medical care in uh, long-term care facilities or nursing homes. So we don't have that concentration of high-risk patients so that there are uh, large numbers of both uh, illness with COVID-19 as well as um, deaths in certain types of institutions. Um, the challenges that we face um, in Ukraine now, uh, the biggest problem is the lack of information. People, um, uh, a recent poll showed that about 65% of people in Ukraine believe that the virus was uh, artificially produced in a laboratory. Half of them believe it was deliberately introduced into the environment and the other half believes that it was not, that it was an accident. But that's two thirds of people in Ukraine believe that this is not a natural occurrence. Um, this has been pushed quite a bit by the Russian disinformation sphere and um, in Ukraine, it has caught on with people. When asked if they would take a uh, vaccine against uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, 
uh, over 50% of Ukrainians say that they would not. That is a long campaign of anti-vaccination that's been going on for very many years. We fought it when we were at the ministry and we actually got the vaccination rates up, say for measles up to 92, 93% from 44% when we came in. And now since um, uh, the, uh, we left the ministry, that number has dropped back down to 30 to 40%. So you need to have consistent, strong communications that understandable, that reaches most people to be able to get the true information across. Um, another another uh, problem uh, is that the, in, that the um, government hasn't synchronized its communication. So even though people were told to stay home in a lockdown, the president was shown on television sitting in a cafe talking to people without wearing a mask in an enclosed environment. People start doubting the um, instructions and recommendations that are being given by the government when um, they see that their uh, government leaders are not uh, holding to those requirements. Um, and the last um, is uh, uh, because of this severe lockdown uh, that's been going on, uh, many of the up until now transparent government um, procedures have become has, have started to be done be behind closed doors. Um, for instance, an example is to buy PPE. Um, uh, when we were at the Ministry of Health, we actually created a, um, a, a procurement agency that would procure on a national level medicines as well as medical devices and medical equipment. Um, when the pandemic started and uh, when the government was uh, not um, doing very well in organizing how it should procure things, instead of going to the procurement agency, the Ministry of Health went and directly procured uh, PPE from China at a price that was twice as high as that which was being procured within Ukraine by NGOs. Um, when these things happen, it starts to look again as though uh, the old corrupt practices are returning. And often what happens in um, uh, critical situations when there's a crisis, um, government institutions as well as people fall back on that which they're used to. And a lot of the advances that have been made in transparency and openness in uh, fighting corruption are starting to, uh, to be challenged and uh, some of the old practices are returning. So at this point, what are we, where are we in Ukraine? At this point, we have a um, several rules in place, which is uh, social distancing or that, that unfortunate word, social distancing, but physical distancing um, is a requirement when you're standing in line in any public places, um, wearing masks or a covering, a face covering over your mouth and nose, and it's very specifically even written mouth and nose in public places where you can't keep public distancing is in place. And not all, uh, all, all blessed have been able to open businesses and open restaurants yet. Some of them are open, some of them are closed. Here in Kyiv, uh, we still are under a semi-lockdown, although most restaurants have opened and um, there have been big problems because people are not holding to the rules. They are, they are coming back out en masse, uh, not believing that there actually is a threat from the virus because many of them say they don't know anybody who was sick from the virus and if they haven't seen it with their own eyes, it's lack of trust and belief in what the government is telling them makes them um, uh, do things that are somewhat dangerous to their own health and the health around them. So, okay, so uh, we're just going to try to wrap up now uh, regarding the United States version. So we still have some questions that we will be asking you and, and Dr. Uh, Lusniak. So uh, I turn now the um, podium to Dr. Uh, Boris Lusniak so that he can give the US version. Please. Great, thank, thank you so much, Yuhud, and thank you, Udana, for that great perspective. Uh, it, it's certainly interesting to hear both some aspect of how things are contrasting in Ukraine versus America, but also how many things are very, very similar. Uh, so I, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I know most of our listeners are probably US based. And, and so uh, I think a lot of us are, are very much more intrigued in terms of what's going on globally. Uh, but let me sort of rehash in the next five minutes or so of what where we've been. And, and it doesn't take us long to sort of go back in time to realize our world changed. Little did we know our world changed as most of us were beginning to celebrate the new year. Because on December 31st, 2019, right, is the time where the WHO office in China was informing or, or informed by the Chinese government of some atypical pneumonias that were killing people small numbers, unknown etiology, 
And if you go back in time, right, today is we're in mid-July. So this is seven and a half months ago. At this point. Uh, we didn't even understand what was going to hit us at that point. So from that first sort of uh, WHO involvement in China, we had our first case here in the United States on January 21st. It was an imported case, someone who had been to Wuhan province. Uh, and we had our first death on February 6th. So again, look at this timeline of how quickly things flowed. By February 25th in the United States, uh, Nancy Mincenier, who I, I know pretty well at the CDC, uh, was quoted of saying and got into trouble over this, that this might be bad, right? That was a quote giving us a heads up of how the CDC was beginning to look at this. By March 11th, WHO had designated this as, as a pandemic. And I'll remind the group out there that there is a, a definition for the world, uh, the concept of a pandemic. Pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. It usually takes three features, a novel, brand new pathogen, one that our bodies had not seen before, one to which we are not immune. That's point number one. Point number two is it needs to cause disease or death. It needs to be severe. The third component of a pandemic is it needs to be transmissible from one person to another. And all of a sudden we were there. We had this disease, a virus that we had not seen before. We knew of other coronaviruses. We knew that we had previous pandemics. There were three pandemics in the 20th century all of them related to influenza. We had a pandemic in this century, 2009, 2010, also a influenza virus. So this is our first modern history pandemic that is not an influenza virus. By the 13th of March, US declares a national emergency based upon this, uh, this brand new pandemic. By the 17th of March, we have cases in all 50 states. Notice the spread, how quickly this is going. By April 2nd, we have a million cases worldwide. And I'm going to go a little bit into this idea of how logarithmically it has been spreading. It took three months for the world to get up to 100,000 people that were diagnosed with a positive test. It then took 12 days for the next 100,000 to get up to 200,000. It took three days to get up to 300,000. It took another two days to get up to 400. And that's what we've been seeing is incredible spread of this disease. Our current statistics globally, 12 and a half million people affected with 560,000 deaths in the United States, 3.2 million people with positive COVID as of this morning with 134,000. I'm gonna finish up this presentation, not giving answers. I'm getting a little bit of feedback out there. So please mute your mics hitting some of the issues. And some of them overlap with what Ulan has been talking about. So what we've seen is spread throughout the United States in a rather quick fashion. So in no particular order, where were the issues that we're dealing with here in the United States? First of all, the diagnostics, right? Major screw up from the CDC, major problem early on, bad tests being put out there, slow in terms of tests getting out there. Uh, and, uh, ultimately taking a group effort, not only the CDC now, working now in conjunction with public health labs at the state and local level, working with clinical labs, working with the private sector. Uh, we're still not where we need to be from testing, but we've gone from a really bad situation to a somewhat better situation. Uh, there's development now of rapid tests. These are gonna be critical because people are still waiting long periods of time between the time that they have their nasal mucosa swab to the point of getting a result that it makes no sense epidemiologically, right? I need to be able to diagnose quickly so I can do something about those people who are positives. There's still issues of sensitivity of some of the testing. So that's point number one, the issues. Serological tests are being developed. These are the, the antibody tests to denote whether I have had a reaction to coronavirus. Problem there, fast development of these tests, lack of quality control, there's issues of sensitivity and specificity, how accurate are these tests? And what are they really telling me? We really don't know what it means to have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. We don't understand whether that means I'm protected or not. And it seems at least the initial data that's coming out there is telling us that even if I have an immune response to it, it may not be long lasting. This is a problem. Disease complications. Rare complications of the disease, but we've had you know, this pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome out there in children, much like Kawasaki syndrome, you know, causing problems in, in the pediatric population, strokes, hypercoagulable states, perhaps long-term effects. 
I'll emphasize yet again, novel virus means that we don't know what it's bringing to us, right? We have a problem because each and every day we're learning something brand new. Personal protective equipment as an issue in the United States. We went from shortages, you know, of, of the N95 medical grade masks, shortages to other equipment. We then went from a philosophy in our country of saying, well, no one should be masked other than the medical profession to a philosophy of saying, hey, everybody, cloth masks, face coverings are important for the spread of disease. This is evolution. It's not a weakness of public health. It, in essence, is we're learning on the job with this. Transmission of the disease as an issue. We've gone from a philosophy of large droplets, that is the six foot, two meter rule will be protective along with my mask, to now a metamorphosis right now to this idea of aerosol spread, airborne spread, right? WHO is now being castigated for not getting on board. There are now transitions taking place. Our public health response, very critical. It still remains very basic, but very important. Testing, tracing, isolation, and quarantine. This is an important aspect other non-pharmaceutical interventions. We go back 100 years to the same recommendations we gave during the Spanish flu. Now, not that I was around back then, but we emphasize the idea of washing your hands and staying away from others. That is a basic working way of dealing with this problem. Social physical distancing is an important aspect to all this. Obviously, it comes with its repercussions because people want to be free. They want to go to the beaches. They want to enjoy. And this goes against almost an American philosophy of you don't tell me what to do. Health disparities, health equity. We've seen issues along racism in this country. Certainly, we've had the social upheaval with the, the murder of George Floyd. We now have problems that are built into our health systems that show that underserved populations, minority populations are at higher risk of death and disease. Medical care response, surge capacity. We've had issues of messaging in this country. What is the president saying? What is Fauci saying? What's Burke saying? I can't they get together and actually give us the same message? A lot of confusion out there. Consumer product shortages. Finally, I was at, my wife was at Costco yesterday. We finally found Costco toilet paper after all this time. What an American concept that you couldn't find that, right? I mean, it goes back to, you know, Radjanski Soyuz, right, where you stood in line for things. That's what we, you know, had here for a while. Economic impact continues, unemployment, stock market, events, travel, national, international po politics, the issue of the WHO and who's to blame for all this. So many issues sort of come to light in the midst of the pandemic. Now, right now, we're at a bad time in America, right? We thought that we saw the epicenter in New York, and that was handled, a lot of suffering, a lot of death there, but that eased, and then we were sort of in a complacent period, right? We sort of thought, oh, this is good. We can reopen. The White House came out actually with a pretty good plan of saying, here's how we're going to reopen. We're going to be very strict. We're going to follow the parameters, and where need be, we're going to back up to previous phases. What's happened was a free-for-all, and we're now suffering in the United States the repercussions of that free-for-all. Look at the data in California, look at the data in Arizona, look at the data in Texas and in Florida. We have a problem here in the United States. This is an embarrassment for the richest country on this planet. This is an embarrassment for public health here uh, in that our parameters are not following the parameters of Europe. We've been banned from going to Europe, right, because we are a country with disease. Flabbergasting flabbergasting for us to be here. Over and out. All right. So thank you for uh, that presentation. I'll just have a couple of questions. Uh, some of the uh, uh, comments were, uh, were quite helpful. Uh, uh, this is a question to both panelists, uh, and Bordis will be first. It's just that, what do you think are the most common um, uh, myths about COVID that people have in the United States? And then after you finish, the same question will be uh, to Dr. Ulan. Well, a uh, common myth, 99% of, of this is harmless, right? I mean, this is said, and, and people, I'm, I'm being as apolitical as possible, okay? I, I'm not here as a partisan, and I don't want to introduce politics into the Ukrainian Institute of America in our discussion here. I'm speaking as a public health person. That is bad information, right? When you say 99% are harmless, look at death, look at disease, look at these repercussions. The reality is that a majority of people do have mild symptoms, right? The initial data that was coming through was showing that 80% were either asymptomatic of positives, were asymptomatic or had mild symptoms. That is great, but the other 20% are having problems. So this idea of saying that it's not going to hurt me, it's very mild, 
That's a major myth. And then the myth of youth, and we've seen that as a problem in the United States, which is without a doubt, data show that the higher age brackets are at higher risk of severity of disease as well as death, but that doesn't mean that a college age student is totally immune to this. And so I think those two myths have to be dealt with, that this is a community outbreak, a wide community, the community happens to be the world in this case, and we have to deal with it as a community. It can't be you do something, I won't do it, right? So that I think is part of the myth of breaking. Right, and Dr. Ulana, I think you um, touched upon it when you were talking about uh, the uh, the fact that a lot of individuals are uh, looking at it differently. But what is the perspective of Ukraine regarding the common myth that you see? Some of the myths are well. First of all, as I said, uh, that um, that this was a uh, deliberate um, attempt to release a virus into the um, into the uh, environment so that um, as an attack, uh, most of the time they're saying Ukrainians believe that it was done by China, but there's a some percentage that say that it was done by the United States. So this is a deliberate attack um, to uh, hit the world economy. A second uh, myth, and this is a little bit different, this is more of a Ukrainian traditional medicine myth that um, if you uh, eat garlic and you eat lemons, that this will help to um, stop the virus from progressing to a disease. Another issue is that um, because the virus is in your, uh, when they do the PCR test, they go down your nose or into your throat, that if you gargle with salt, salt water, that this will stop the virus from infecting you and that you may be fine. And then the last thing is that um, uh, there's a, a myth that, um, it doesn't even exist at all. That all of what we're hearing on the news and the fact that they put Ukraine in a lockdown was a ploy by the government to get more control over people, to steal more money, to, uh, they, there wasn't enough money in the budget. And so they were trying to save money um, by not having any services available for people. Um, which unfortunately, of course, is not true because instead what it's done is it's ruined the economy and um, now there's even less money coming into the government uh, system so that it's much more difficult to even come out of the economic crisis that happened with this. So do you find that, that it's more in the like Salah versus the city uh, that there are that uh, thought of, uh, of that, uh, what you were mentioning about the fact that it was uh, artificial and so forth, is there, is there like a uh, disparity in the locations, so it, just from your perspective? No, there's not, because um, uh, Russian disinformation is broadcast all over Ukraine through television channels owned by oligarchs and by pro-Russian owners. Therefore, most of the information people are getting is false information. So it doesn't matter if you're in the city or if you're in the Salah, if you get your information from uh, television and from sites like Stranayu-A or other um, well-known uh, Russian propaganda outlets, then that is what you're hearing. Um, my own personal experience, um, when there's no public transportation, we were still coming into the office and um, we were taking taxis. And so I would, I took a lot of taxis and speaking to taxi drivers, those who live in New York understand this. Speaking to taxi drivers gets you a nice good uh, cross section of what's going on because they tell you not only about themselves, but about the passengers. And over 50% of the taxi drivers that I've been with say that there is no actual virus. All of this is made up. And this is a government plot to steal money from the people of Ukraine. All right, so just a question to uh, uh, both of you. I'll, um, I'll ask uh, Dr. Boris first, is as countries lift the entry bans, including Ukraine, what does it mean for Ukraine and its road to recovery? And uh, also for Ukrainians who have families abroad, what is the safe way to travel and interact with them? So um, Dr. Boris, if you can answer that first. Well, you know, let me just sort of speak generically, whether it's national, you know, domestic travel or international travel. Um, you know, I still think it's, it's a dangerous time. I would think twice about travel at this stage. Uh, yes, the airlines are, are suffering. Yes, we want to support uh, sort of travel industry economically. Uh, the issue right now is we are still at a stage right now of rampant disease in this country in general, right? Yes, we know where the hotspots are, but the disease is out there. COVID-19 is being uh, spread between person to person. 
Uh, indoor environments, i.e. the insides of airplanes are problematic. If you can drive somewhere, drive somewhere, right? Uh, stay away from large crowds uh, and, and you need to be careful. In terms of international, it's kind of interesting how initially the world really felt that, you know, international sort of blockages and, and bans on travel. We saw this during Ebola. We saw this early in, in, in this pandemic. Uh, it are effective only to slow down the process. They are never effective to actually stop fully a spread of a disease that has high levels of transmissibility. Uh, so what we see here is, I think, a, a reaction, you know, of making sure that we at least don't overburden our current medical care systems with a lot of cases. That's the whole concept of flattening the curve, right? Was not that we're going to make this thing disappear. It was the idea that partly that we were able to affect a limited you know, effect, flatten the curve enough to have the surge not be so overwhelming that our system breaks down. I think when it comes to international travel, I would just tell our audience out there, just be really careful, right? Um, you know, in, in the near future, it's, it's a higher risk venture. Mm -hmm. Donna, what do you think? Um, I have a couple of friends who've just recently returned to Ukraine from the United States because they work here or they had to travel here for work. Um, they said that um, on some of one of the airlines, the, they had not followed the rules of having an empty seat between people who were sitting and that they really wasn't very well organized to um, decrease the risk of um, getting infected. Whereas on a different airline, and I'll say the name of the airline, it's Delta, that they did actually a very good job. They explained everything. They were sending them messages. They gave them uh, masks. They gave them um, uh, sanitizers. They made sure that the seats were empty between uh, those other ones. They talked to them about how they had put in HEPA filters and so on. So I think that it's even different between different um, uh, airlines if you're going to be traveling. There are a lot of restrictions and those restrictions make it difficult to travel. Say Ukrainians are not allowed into the Shenhen zone. And so even uh, traveling uh, with a layover in the Shenhen zone is actually quite difficult. Shenhen zone is European countries plus Sweden, um, uh, Norway, Iceland, and Switzerland, um, and the UK. Um, so I think that it, it is difficult to travel right now. Would I travel if I really needed to? I would, because I feel that I am um, intelligent enough to understand how to protect myself. And I know what to do. Um, if you feel comfortable that you know what to do and that you trust the people that you're traveling with that, and it's necessary to do, I think that you can travel. But remember, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands again, use sanitizer if you can't. If you're indoors, anywhere where you can't distance from people, wear a mask, cover your nose and your mouth. Don't touch your mask, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your nose, don't touch your mouth after you've touched surfaces that you don't uh, know who else has been around. And those are the important things that you really need to remember. And if you can control your environment somewhat, then it is safer to come out. We can't stay in isolation forever. We have to learn how to take responsibility for ourselves and how to make it responsible for others around us. Interestingly enough, our organization, RQA, we, um, uh, we created a whole set of um, advice and instructions for local governments on how they could make their own uh, communities safer um, in Ukraine particularly about where they can put sanitizers in, how they can make special bus service and hours for elderly who are high risk groups, how they can provide more services for the higher risk groups, because that's really who we're protecting here is we, we are protecting the high risk groups and of course, everyone. Um, so I think that um, slowly we'll be coming out of this and it will take uh, until the end of the year, I think for us to really be comfortable in any kind of uh, traveling. Uh, freely throughout um, throughout our different countries. So the next question that I have is is, is regarding since we we focus in a lot on the physical aspects, but um, I know in my practice and, and when I see patients, there's been a, a, certainly a mental stress on everybody in, in every way. Not only in the uh, the fact that perhaps they were ill or have some uh, someone who they know are ill and and how they are dealing and coping with it. Um, but the question for both of you, and we'll, we'll start with you, Dr. Rudana, regarding the uh, the mental uh, state and, and um, the uh, way that the Ukrainians are seeing that in the in, in Ukraine, and then we'll follow that with uh, what uh, Dr. Bardo.
artist feels in the United States? Um, well, uh, here in Ukraine, we're going through a uh, transformation of our healthcare system. Luckily, we already transformed our primary care system and um, our, the population had someone to call and someone to talk to if they started having symptoms to ask questions. That was tremendously helpful because without a, that first contact of primary care, when most people don't know what the answers to the questions are, I think that we would have had um, many much, much, much harder time getting through the first few months of um, the pandemic. Um, secondly, because we haven't quite gotten to um, the second level of healthcare transformation, only on April 1st were hospitals and specialized care um, entering into the new system of payment with, um, uh, we're, we provide universal health care with a national health insurer called the National Health Service of Ukraine. And um, only after April 1st was this change in financing started and some changes were made even to the uh, implementation of it where additional payments were given for the hospitals. One of our biggest problems was a lack of PPE and unfortunately also a lack of knowledge on how to use PPE and when to use it by Ukrainian physicians because they haven't been trained properly. And medical education is a very big problem in Ukraine. If you don't know um, the basics, it's very difficult to protect yourself and to protect your patients. But um, uh, the people who have their own primary care physicians, um, in the past, you, you were assigned your primary, you were assigned your physician by your place of residency. Now Ukrainians are able to choose their primary care physicians and the physicians that will be treating them. And I think that that trust that developed since the summer of 2017 or 2018, I'm sorry, when the um, when the health reform started, truly helped people to have trust in someone that can answer their questions for them. So I want to thank the primary care physicians of Ukraine for doing such a fantastic job in uh, communicating with their patients when there was a lack of communication from anybody else. Well, thank you. And Dr. Bordes? Yeah, you know, the World Health Organization defines health as what? As complete, complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. I'm a strong believer in that definition. And you, you, you touch, you know, you hit the nail on the head with the idea is oftentimes we neglect the mental. The social well-being is a big problem, right? We as physicians tend to deal with the physical aspects. The mental aspects is one that usually falls through the cracks. And in the midst of this pandemic, we are seeing the repercussions of it falling through the cracks. Several things that come to mind, one of which is the idea of, of, of anxiety, the idea of depression, the idea of loneliness as a public health issue, right? Uh, we see substance abuse going up, right? The opioid uh, problem is back and, and people are dying of, of opioid uh, overdosages at, at higher levels. Uh, we have people who feel disconnected. We have people who, because of the messaging issue, don't understand where to turn to for the correct information, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this begins at a community level. What I ask all of you out there, all our listeners today is, if you know somebody who's out there, right, who's alone, who's lonely, who needs that contact, we may not be able to be there physically, uh, but we can certainly reconnect with individuals. We have to turn into society that in the midst of a pandemic doesn't become just self-centered. It's about me, right? It's really about the community. Even the idea of wearing a mask, which has here in the United States almost become a political statement, it is not. I emphasize again what we've been pushing all along. Wearing a mask shows that I care about you. I'm preventing things from happening to you. And I think we need to get our national and our community psyche back into this idea. And that will be one of the pathways to deal with the mental health issue, right? Of us reconnecting in the midst of us staying away from each other. I can, if I can just add something, um, wearing the mask has created a lot of problems here in Ukraine as well. I mean, even as we're talking right now, when I do this, you have a much harder time um, reading me because so many of us read facial expressions when we talk and we're actually um, uh, working on some um, advice in Ukrainian for Ukrainians. Um, there's been a, a, a big problem for those that are say are hard of hearing or have problems with hearing and deafness because they read lips and you can't read lips that way. So there's been quite a bit of um, uh, resistance, I think, to covering the face, and it has to do with the feeling of community. So we need to find other ways 
to feel that community. And that is perhaps as we are talking on Zoom, uh, when you're not physically in the same room together, calling people more often, um, writing letters more often, and keeping in contact in a different way. Even walking down the street, um, people have tended to not even smile at each other anymore. If they are smiling, um, it's not visible beneath the mask. And it's created quite a bit of, um, uh, of uh, isolation, um, which leads to difficulties with dealing with emotions, with depression. Um, and um, in the United States, I know that there's been an, an increase in the number of suicides and a lot of more calls to suicide lines. In Ukraine, we don't have that many statistics to be able to look at that, but we do have a suicide prevention line called Lifeline Ukraine for veterans and their families. And they have experienced a big um, uptick in the number of calls uh, since the um, uh, isolation or the uh, um, since the lockdown started in Ukraine. So another other question is uh, to both panelists, uh, uh, do you feel that we've flattened the curve? Uh, I know that in certain parts of uh, the United States, especially in the Northeast where there were major lockdowns and various other things, but the, the uh, areas that are in the Southern part and, and the Western part of the country, they tend to uh, now have a surge of anything. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, we'll start with Dr. Bordes first. Uh, you know, as a nation, you, we certainly have regionalism here and, and actually here the northeast of the United States, you know, uh, is looking pretty good right now compared to what's going on in many other spots of the United States. The question is, how long will this be sustainable? And I think it's directly related in proportion to this idea of how quickly we're reopening, right? I think the more that we give into this idea that, you know, we're trying to get back to a normal as if we're pre-COVID is the pathway of danger. So, you know, let's look at the statistics and, you know, I don't have the visual here that I'll show you, but I'm going to sort of draw it out. We were about two to four weeks behind Europe. Remember, it wasn't that long ago where everybody was looking at Italy as being the hot spot in Europe. People were dying. It was devastating, devastating intensive care units, hospitals overfilled. It then moved a little bit to Spain. But in general, if we look at the European Union, what we see is about two to four weeks ahead of us, their numbers are going up. And then our numbers are going up two to four weeks later. We've seen what Europe did under very different circumstances, I understand, but more or less successfully is they came down and they continued on the downtrend. We came down exactly two to four weeks behind, and then all of a sudden we flattened, and now we're doing this which means we've done something different. We've been to going down the pathway of a mistake. And the mistake really was letting down our guard when it came to physical distancing and, and, and wearing of masks and, and those basic public health measures. And then secondly was the whole idea of reopening a society that somehow the economy was more important than health. And I, I admit to you, the economy is a key feature of health. Don't forget, social well-being is part of the definition of health but we aren't going to have a healthy economy with a sick population. And that's where we're sort of headed. Okay, so we have now uh, some questions from uh, the audience. Uh, just they were saying about, uh, just for Dr. Ulana, uh, how is the supply for the medications uh, that uh, are um, currently purported to work for uh, some improvement in, in the symptoms and we're referring to like the hydroxychloroquine and, and various other things that are utilized. What is the availability in Ukraine of these uh, medications and are they being used? Do they have, uh, um, do we have access to that in Ukraine? Uh, what is uh, the, uh, the, the status? Um, well, first of all, as we know, there are no medications that have been proven to um, uh, to work in uh, stopping treating um, the disease as of yet. There are clinical studies that have shown some results, but um, we still don't have any medications that are, are being used on a regular basis. There have been many um, attempts with very many different ideas. Uh, unfortunately, in Ukraine, there is not uh, a great deal of um, availability of all of the uh, innovative medications that are present in other countries. And um, we've been pushing for uh, to make sure that any, any medications that are being procured or given to patients that they are being done in, um, in the 
environment of a clinical trial rather than just um, prescribing medicines. Um, it's a it's a really big problem for for Ukraine because we haven't really got access to it. But as you see from our numbers, um, if those numbers really do reflect the amount of uh, patients that have gotten severe uh, illness and by the time they got to the hospitals and how many of them have been on ventilators um, and our uh, lethality rate so far, it isn't a huge amount. Um, there are actually four medications that um, uh, are patented in Ukraine that are being tested on patients. I uh, don't have very much faith in the fact that any of them will show any positive results because they've been around for a very long time and they've been purported to treat everything you know, from heart disease to Ebola. So I don't know that they really are, gonna, um, are going to uh, come out to be anything truly helpful. Um, but at the moment, we're not having an issue with it. So I think that the question is a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more, for us, the problem has been basic, not whether we have experimental medicines. For us, the problem is, do we have hospitals that have uh, the capability to isolate patients? Uh, do we have enough ventilators? Do we have PPE? I mean, that's the basic things that were being taken care of. When it started, when the uh, pandemic started and the government started buying tests, they were buying the rapid tests. They weren't buying PCR tests. They didn't even know which tests to buy. They, we spent millions of dollars on unnecessary tests that we are now throwing away because we didn't need them. Then the laboratory system wasn't set up to, um, to actually get the results of the test because the laboratory system has been neglected over such a long period of time. There was no capability to actually, okay, great. Now we have PCRs, but you can't actually get any results. So it was, it was taken up to two weeks to get a result from, a, from the lab test. And only now has, after four months, has the system been set up in such a way that we have mostly the equipment that we need and the reagents that we need. And then we found out we don't have enough lab personnel that know how to do the test. So now we started training lab personnel. Um, again, it hasn't been a very well-coordinated response. And um, mostly it seems like the um, fallback position is hide your head in the sand and let's wait until this is over. Um, very similar to actually the beginning uh, in the war in Ukraine, when every two weeks they told us it would only be, it'd be over in two weeks. That's what they kept telling us with the lockdown. It'll be two more weeks, it'll be two more weeks, then two more weeks. Now it's two more weeks. Now we're not going to open if there's too many cases, but we're opening and the cases are going up, but we're still opening. So it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense um, what the policy is and what the strategy is at the level of the government. Okay, thank you. Also, turning to a little bit of a different from a, a, from a question pro, uh, proposed to, I don't know who would like to answer this, is that regarding the vaccinations, because um, there are different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that, that, that are found in different parts of the world, and uh, then the, the whole concept of the fact that uh, individuals who do have a, an, an immune, immunologic response, uh, we don't know the, the fact that, that these titers are actually effective in, in preventing any issues. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the information regarding uh, these concerns and the development of the vaccine? Well, let, let me begin from the U.S. perspective here. Uh, certainly the issue of uh, multiple strains, you know, there are some modifications that have occurred in, in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you know, simply there's a Chinese version and a European version that has some distinct changes. It's still, again, seven and a half months into this, difficult to determine what whether there are distinct enough changes that this won't immunologically be able to be handled by a potential vaccine. Uh, the vaccine world is very different than it, than it used to be. I mean, you know, when you look at the idea of what's being looked at from a uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the name of the virus of vaccine to treat COVID-19 or to prevent COVID-19, uh, it's not the old fashioned ways anymore, right? We're talking about several categories of vaccines. These include genetic vaccines where we use one or more coronavirus genes to actually be the eliciting thing to, to listening component for immune response. You have viral vector vaccines, you have protein-based vaccines, you have whole virus vaccines, which are the old-fashioned way, use a weakened or inactivated coronavirus. 
And then we have current vaccines that potentially could be repurposed. BCG for tuberculosis is one that's being looked at. Right now, there's, believe it or not, 106, over 165 vaccine candidates in the PAP pipeline. This is a worldwide endeavor. It's like the space race. Everybody wants to be the first here, right? 135 are preclinical studies, so they're in the animal phase. And now you have the rest, 14 in the phase one, 11 in the phase two, four in the phase three. Uh, little, well, little known is that on June 25th, uh, China approved a vaccine for limited use under quote unquote military specially needed drug approval. So their vaccines are, are being used out there. The four that are being looked at from the US government's perspective and where US government funding has been put in is uh, done by companies called Moderna, the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca, Pfizer and BioNTech and Novavax. Those three or those four are now in various stages of studies but you're absolutely right. Don't forget, this is a novel vaccine. We have no idea. In these initial phases, we're looking for safety. Does it cause a problem? We're looking for an immune response of some kind. But until we get into the phase three studies and even population phase, we're not gonna be sure whether this works. It's interesting, the FDA on June 30th came up with their guidance for industry for vaccines. Guess what they're telling companies? They're saying that they expect that a COVID-19 vaccine would prevent disease or decrease in severity in at least how many percentage of people? And they're shooting for the numbers of 50%. So in these unknown times, half is better than nothing, right? But there's a lot to be learned in the vaccine world. And don't forget, we've never ever made a coronavirus vaccine. So this is brand new. This is all uncharted territory. There's a couple of other questions as, as uh, uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Ulana, are harm reduction programs being engaged or supported in Ukraine in the response to the virus among substance abusers in Ukraine? Uh, as it says that they've been effective around the world promoting the health of substance abusers, particularly reducing the spread of HIV. Um, what is uh, being done in Ukraine? Um, well, uh, harm reduction program uh, for those that um, uh, are substance abusers or have HIV, um, sex workers and so on, um, are relatively new in Ukraine. Um, when we came into the ministry back in 2016, only NGOs had been providing these types of services. So when we came in, we actually changed this and now the um, services are procured from NGOs paid for by the budget as well as all of the medicines that are necessary for those patients, including replacement um, uh, therapy for those who, who need it. Um, mm. Whether this is being used for COVID, I can't tell you because I'm not at the ministry anymore. And so I am not um, aware of those types of things going on. I haven't seen anything at all like that. Frankly, I think that the ministry has done a pretty poor job in responding to this. And there are so many things that could have been done better as well as um, building on and using the experience that we had over the last few years, um, changing the way we're treating tuberculosis, changing the way it's procuring, acting more quickly when, um, when there's an outbreak or an, an epidemic happening in the country. There were a lot of really good steps forward that are now being ignored by the current Ministry of Health and the one that was the last two ministers, because I was three ministers ago now, four ministers ago. Um, and it, it has to do with politics. A similar problem that's happening in the United States, as Boris was saying with the masks, that um, this pandemic has become very politically charged. And instead of using the experiences of the past governments and past successes, um, the uh, politics of uh, the president and, and his political party is to ignore everything that was done in the past, say that it was wrong and want to do things their own way. You can't do that when you have something like this. You really need to build on those strengths that you've had in the past. So just the last question, um, uh, essentially uh, to wrap things up, uh, is uh, just as a general statement is, uh, what is the prediction about the virus in the near future for, uh, from your standpoint in, in terms of what, what, is, uh, uh, what, what your thoughts are on, um, well, Dr. Dana and Dr. Buddhist, if you can just give your final uh, uh, thoughts on that. Um, I start, we'll start with Dr. Dana first. Um, my thoughts on how things will move forward is it's 
unfortunately, I don't think that we have a lot enough data to be able to predict what's going to happen because we haven't been very good at predicting up until now. I think one of the most important things we need to new, do right now is gather data and keep track of what's happening, watching what's what works and what doesn't work, and using evidence um, evidence based decision making to move forward instead of responding to that which is in the press. Because I think frankly, bottom line is that the media drove the pandemic response. It was driven by the media, not by the scientists, not by the epidemiologists, and not by the politicians. The politicians were driven by the media. The hype that was created about it, the fact that even before peer review articles were put out there that were never confirmed, really caused a major problem. People are confused and they don't know what to do. I think we need to have clear messaging clear directions and it should be done by scientists, by the doctors and by the epidemiologists and get politics out of here. The politicians should be standing next to them, nodding their heads and signing off on the project so that they can move forward based on scientific fact and on evidence, not on somebody's idea because of them being in politics or wanting to be popular. Dr. And, Burris? And from my perspective, and you sort of the path ahead. So first I'm gonna start off with sort of with the reality check. And, and the reality check may sound pessimistic. That's not my intent, it's reality. I'm gonna use two quotes recently heard from a person who's been speaking his mind, getting into trouble lately, and that's Anthony Fauci at, at the NIH. Quote number one on June 10th, now we have something that turned out to be my worst nightmare. In the period of four months, it has devastated the world. That's reality, so let's deal with it. It's not to say, oh, we're giving up. It's a reality check. On Ju July 9th, referring to the opening up of schools, he said, it is not going to be easy because we've never done it before. This is uncharted water. So there's two aspects to this, one of which is this is real. Secondly is, guess what? I'll be the first to admit, science is learning on the job. Now, here's my optimism, and this is why this is important. The optimism is, I mentioned before that we've had several pandemics in the 20th and, and one in the 21st century. <laughs> I'll submit to you as an optimist, and I always say in public health, Ulana knows this as she transitioned into the world of public health. Public health, you have to be an optimist. Pessimists wash out early because of so many barriers in front of us. You have to be an optimist. I teach this to my students at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Using that optimism out there, we can do this. It needs to be a battle. This is a war. We need to control COVID-19 in the community. Define your community. We need to control it. Test, trace, isolate, quarantine, key features. The three W's as being touted right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, right? And then let's go back to what the White House had said in their plan for reopening America. Let's follow a plan. It said to the states, advise your citizens regarding protocols for social distancing and face coverings. There is a sense in the White House, this is where we move ahead. Let's stop double talking. Let's stop confusing the message. And then it also said to the states in the White, and look at this up at whitehouse.gov, monitor the conditions and immediately take steps to limit and mitigate any rebounds or outbreaks by restarting a phase or returning to an earlier phase, depending on severity. That is the golden way of doing this. Let's not just sort of go blindly. We can do this. And again, I'm an optimist. We've never had this mixture of science at this highest level and the pandemic in world history. We will overcome. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Boris and uh, Dr. Ulana, uh, for a very informative session. I hope everyone who joined us uh, found this to be interesting and uh, a topic of conversation. And I hope uh, you continue to support the, uh, the Ukrainian Institute, which uh, will continue to provide uh, educational programs. And um, I turn over the, uh, the podium to uh, our uh, president. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Ukrainian Institute of America and all of the members in our audience, I'd like to extend my sincerest thanks to Drs. Lushniak, Sukun, and Lagun for taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules to lead such an informed and thought-provoking discussion, truly greatly appreciated. Uh, and many thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us. We appreciate your interest in the Ukrainian Institute and in our programs, and your lively participation in the Q&A played a critical role in the success of today's program. Thank you also to everyone in the audience who has already made a donation. We are extremely grateful for your financial support without which we could not continue to fulfill our mission. 
Of course, if you haven't had the opportunity to make that donation yet because you are so engrossed in the discussion, you may do so at any time after the program ends. If you did enjoy today's discussion, please also remember to spread the word. This webinar was recorded and can be found on the Ukrainian Institute's YouTube channel, and a link to the recording may also be found on our Facebook page. Of course, please continue to check our website for upcoming events of all kinds. We are hopefully, uh, assuming that no uh, phases get rolled back, we're planning uh, an outdoor concert with no uh, exact audience uh, on the steps of the Ukrainian Institute on September 12th. So please stay tuned for further uh, information about that. Uh, thank you again. And in the meantime, uh, be well, stay safe, and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.